You know, the ministry of John the Baptist eventually got him killed. We talk about the reaction today. It's going to be very interesting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery. We are discovering the Bible, the most important book of all. God sent us his word and through the 66 books, he tells us what we need to know. Very, very good. Now we'll talk about that in three minutes. Corey and Ryan are coming up in about 12 minutes time. Go ahead, Corey. Today I'm going to be discussing the different Herods that are mentioned in the New Testament, in the Gospels and in Acts, right? Yeah, okay, so Jesus on several occasions claimed to be God. As a matter of fact, he even claimed to be the I am that I am of Exodus chapter three. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about a little bit later on. Very good. Look forward to that. They're coming up in about 12 minutes time, 15 minutes time, right around in there. What are you doing, Jen? Caught in the moment or words matter. I couldn't decide. Matthew 14, 1 through 14. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. A lot of people talk about reactions. You know, scientists talk about reactions today, how this atom reacts with that atom or this chemical reacts with that chemical or what nature does. But today, as we continue reading, we are going to learn how Jesus reacted. And it's fascinating as we read Matthew, we can see just how much impact Jesus Christ was making in this world. His ministry had taken off because he was doing things that only the Messiah could possibly do. And with every step of his life, Jesus was actually fulfilling prophecy hundreds of years old. Even the ministry of John the Baptist would have been shocking. John the Baptist's life was lived out not as a typical priest, but as a prophet living in the wilderness and dressing distinctly. And although there was a requirement for immersion in water by Gentiles wanting to convert to Judaism, John the Baptist taught that all Jews, everybody, must repent from sin and be baptized as well. Matthew 14 tells us of John's confrontation with Herod, the Tetrarch, who was having an inappropriate relationship with his brother's wife. It was this tenacity for truth-telling that ultimately brought John down. John was tragically beheaded for that, even though through this, the ministry of Jesus Christ was coming together for the good of all mankind, that everybody could see it. Now, what is interesting today is to listen to the Lord, 
listen to Jesus Christ as we begin to understand how he reacts. I find this absolutely fascinating. Now, take your Bible guide and turn to the pages of Matthew chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible guide, call us or write to us. We'll send you one. It'll be our pleasure to do so. Just remember, it cost us some money to send it to you. Or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, and click on the Bible guide, and it will take you to a donate page. And from there, you can go to the page where it downloads exactly how we printed it. So that's very, very good. Now let's pray. Father, I pray today as we read from chapter one to 50 or chapter 14, verses one to 14, that you would teach us your way and show us your path. What I mean to say, Lord, is a lot of people are talking about Christianity, but who is it that's living Christianity? And Father, there are those in this audience, there are those who are watching me right now who want to live Christianity. Help us to live it in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen. There's several verses here, actually 12. So let's take a look at this very carefully. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. And therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Verse 5. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. Verse 9. And the king was sorry. But nevertheless, because of the oath and because of those who sat with him, he commanded to be given it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. And she brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Now, this is fascinating. The ministry of John the Baptist eventually got him killed. As Christians, we are against many values the world lives by. The world lives by all kinds of sexual values that as believers in the word of God and Jesus Christ, we don't subscribe to, that we try to live differently. We try to live according to what God says. That's very important. Now, we need to understand that because the laws of man are different than the law of God. Well, let's look at verse 13. It says here, when Jesus heard it, this is Jesus Christ, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. Now, this is fascinating. Jesus, after the death of John the Baptist, desired to get alone with God. But the people followed him. God's ministry in our lives requires God's strength in our lives. Let me explain this. There are times when I go through trouble and I go through difficulty. And the only answer to that is not to sit down and talk about it for 10 hours with the counselor. There are times when I just need to get alone with the Lord. And I go to the ultimate counselor, Jesus Christ, and I say, Lord, what is happening? Help me to understand. And I pour out my heart to him. Now, that's exactly what Jesus Christ was showing us that he was doing with God. Father, help me. This is sorrowful. Help me. But the people wouldn't let him. Very interesting. But we need to do that. We're not Jesus Christ. Fortunately, he's God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's read verse 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw the great multitudes in front of him. 
and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. Boy, this is fascinating. You see, Jesus healed the people because of his compassion. Ministry in Jesus Christ must be done in compassion. There is a great ministry called Compassion. And I, that they, they've explained this, and I totally agree with them. The reason they do what they do is because of their compassion for the people. Compassion is an emotion that is programmed into us and grows as the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and as we move along. As we be, become Christian and get older in our life, we begin to grow these emotions. <laughs> and uh, you, you think, well, I'm getting old, man. I, I cried everything. I was, no, 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 no. It's compassion. God grows compassion in each of us. God grows anger, righteous anger in some of us and each of us. But God grows compassion. Beloved, we, we come into sense with the Spirit of God. And as we get closer to the Spirit of God, we feel the power of Jesus Christ and we feel the power of the Lord. That's true. So we, don't, we, need to, we need to be careful, but at the same time, we need to understand that as we go on in life and as we grow further as Christians and begin to understand God, that the Holy Spirit comes in and grows us. That's very important. And here's what we saw. The ministry of Jesus Christ happened because of compassion. All right, well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And today we're reading through the book of Matthew, of course, which is the first of the four Gospels. And Jesus Christ actually claims to be God, the I am that I am, many times throughout these Gospels, although it gets sort of lost in our English versions of the Bible. So today I want to bring Jesus' words to light by studying the original Greek language of the New Testament. It had been a daily routine for the past 40 years. Moses had been shepherding his father-in-law's flocks in the land of Midian, and this particular day was no different. The now 80-year-old Moses, as he had done many times before, led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the Mount of God. Then, on what was an otherwise ordinary day, the extraordinary happened. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Through this first and most dramatic encounter with this figure, Moses would learn, first of all, that this was none other than God Almighty, the God of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Secondly, to Moses' dismay, he had been chosen to deliver his people, the Israelites, from the bondage of the Egyptians. But who should I tell them sent me, Moses asks. I am who I am, he responds. Therefore, tell them, I am has sent me to you. In other words, I am self-existent. I am the eternal God. I am Yahweh. It is highly significant that Jesus of Nazareth referred to himself a number of times as the great I am. In fact, Jesus uses this expression in two primary ways, both of which echo the Old Testament description of Yahweh. He uses it in a simple predicate construction, such as I am the good shepherd, as well as in the absolute sense, without a predicative expression, so that it is rendered simply as I am. Jesus employs this absolute sense several times throughout the Gospels, particularly in John, although many translations add the word he, rendering the phrase I am he, or change the phrase completely to it is I in order to avoid an awkward reading. However, this term is not at all present in the original Greek text. For example, in Matthew 14, 27, when Jesus is walking on the sea, he speaks words of comfort to his terrified disciples. Be of good cheer, I am he, do not be afraid. But in Greek, the word he is not present. So literally, Jesus said, be of good cheer, I am. 
do not be afraid. Also consider John 18.6, in which Jesus again confesses that I am he. Again, in the original Greek, Jesus simply says, I am. And these words uttered by Jesus caused all those present to physically draw back and fall to the ground. Jesus' repeated use of this phrase in the absolute sense draws on Exodus 3.14 and other Old Testament passages where the phrase clearly refers to God. In using the expression, Jesus is explicitly identifying himself with Yahweh, asserting his eternality, self-existence, and changelessness, and claiming to bear Yahweh's presence on earth, a claim that is undoubtedly confirmed through his death and resurrection. So these are just a few examples, but there are other passages where Jesus refers to himself as I am in the original Greek. And this is so significant because people from other religions will often say that Jesus never claimed to be God. But as I showed in my report, he absolutely and without a doubt did claim to be God many, many times. And he proved that through his physical resurrection from the dead. Truly, Jesus is Lord and Savior and the great I am. And there's no other name under heaven by which you can be saved. So turn to him and live. Hey, come to Jesus Christ today. You know, you've, you've seen people on the news and you've seen people take obvious things and turn them around into crazy lies. And that's what the people did. And the people didn't understand who Jesus truly was. They didn't want to know. And so they switched it around. That's very interesting as we focus on that. We're seeing all of this play out in the news. It's fascinating. All right, Corey. All right. Well, throughout the Gospels and the Book of Acts, there is a man named Herod who is mentioned. And while it's not immediately clear to us when we're reading in the text itself, this Herod is actually three different men named Herod in the Bible specifically. And amazingly, even outside of the Bible, there were a few more than three Herods, uh, all related. Now, it's worth saying here that the original audience of the Gospels and Acts absolutely would have known who was who because they lived through the lives and reigns or terms of these Herods. So uh, some instances in the text do make a distinction though by adding things like the Tetrarch or sometimes they add the less confusing name of a ruler instead of Herod, so like Philip or Antipas. And that helps a lot, but largely we do need to learn from history here to know who is who. And we can know with great confidence, which is the good news. So most people know the most famous Herod, King Herod the Great. He's a really, really interesting historical figure. Uh, he played his cards right with Rome. Uh, he had control of Roman-controlled Israel, which was called the province of Judea at that point in history. Herod the Great built up the land like no one else did. He was famous and infamous, meaning notorious, for his erratic and cruel behavior, even towards those who were closest to him. I mean, we're talking executing immediate family members and children, kind of cruel. Now, Herod the Great is the Herod mentioned in the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. So the king who was ruling when Jesus Christ was born. Herod the Great met with the Magi and had the infant boys of Bethlehem killed. Now, likewise, Luke chapter one tells us that Herod was king of Judea when John the Baptist and Jesus were conceived and subsequently born. Now, it's believed that Herod the Great then died in the spring months of 4 BC. And yes, that does mean that Jesus was born anywhere from 8 to 4 BC before Christ. Now, that discrepancy was a miscalculation of dates done by a Christian monk in the 6th century AD. And I mean, it's unfortunate, but it was an honest mistake. And now the date of Jesus's birth, I think, is even more memorable because of our mistake. But Back to the point, after Herod the Great's death, his area of control, his land in that province of Judea, was split between three of his sons, Herod Antipas, Herod Archelaus, and the Tetrarch Philip, also sometimes known as Herod Philip II. Now, Philip was a half-brother of Antipas and Archelaus, so he had a different mother, but the same father, Herod the Great. Herod Antipas was given the title of Tetrarch, and he ruled over Galilee and Perea uh, throughout the life and ministry of Jesus. And he ruled until his death in AD 
39. Now, before I continue, I want to pop up on your screen a map here of the ancient Roman province of Judea, which is Israel. And you can see these three different sons of Herod the Great and the land that they controlled. So Herod Antipas is controlling the area where Jesus ministered the most in his lifetime. So you see that, that region of Galilee around the Sea of Galilee. And then the area uh, a little bit to the south there over by the Dead Sea, uh, that would have been where, like, for example, Bethany beyond the Jordan was, uh, so where John the Baptist ministered. Now his brother Herod Archelaus for a time ruled over Samaria and Judea, so like Bethlehem and Jerusalem and things like that. And then we see Herod Philip two up there, uh, uh, you know, ruling over that territory like Caesarea Philippi. And you can see coins there that they minted, the back and front of different coins that these brothers minted. The yellow area on the map uh, was a different province, Roman province of Syria at that point. And the green little points were actually given to a female relative of Herod the Great for a time. Okay, so let's continue now that we kind of can see that on the map. Herod Antipas, he's a major player throughout the Gospels. And in fact, it was Herod Antipas who executed John the Baptist and was at the trial of Jesus. Now, Antipas did not build as much as his father, Herod the Great, but he did found a couple of cities, uh, which is interesting. His rule was peaceful. His territory seemed to have prospered economically. His brother, Herod Archelaus, was given the title of Ethnarch. And like we talked about, his territory was Judea and Samaria. But he only lasted 10 years before the Romans uh, took control back and put a Roman governor in charge of that territory. So that would have switched during Jesus' lifetime. Archelaus isn't called Herod in the Gospels, but he does appear by his name Archelaus in Matthew 2, verse 20 in that incident when Joseph is bringing the family back uh, from Egypt and J uh, Joseph avoids the territory of Archelaus and goes to the territory of Antipas instead. Now, the third son of Herod the Great to inherit power was Herod Philip II, uh, or as he's mentioned in Luke 3, Philip the Tetrarch. And that brings us to the third Herod of the New Testament, Herod Agrippa I who is a grandson of Herod the Great. So Antipas, Archelaus, and Philip were his uncles. His uncle Antipas was also his brother-in-law. So it's a really twisted web, these Herod's families, but Agrippa first friendship with two emperors of Rome saw him become king, like his grandfather, uh, from AD 41 to his death in AD 44. He's the Herod of the early chapters of the book of Acts who persecuted Christians, executed the apostle James, imprisoned Peter, and then died of some sort of bowel disease after accepting praise as a god. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, that's excellent. Excellent, Corey. And I'm just fascinated by this. I got lots a whole of bunch Herod. of things lots going through I know. My mind. Lots of Herods, lots of So yeah. is this Antipas then that we're talking about? King Herod Antipas. Yes. All right. In and, our reading and, today. And talking about his brother Philip's wife, whom he was having a relationship with. And this is what ended up uh, Getting the death John of the John the Baptist. Baptist. Yeah, because yes. John the Baptist had gone to Herod and said, this is not lawful mm -hmm. for you to have Herodias. And, and, and so that's kind of what I was going to be talking about today in my segment, caught in the moment or words matter. I didn't know which one to choose because they're both relevant. This passage struck me. So we've heard about Herod the Tetrarch. We've heard that John the Baptist has come to him and said, hey, it is not lawful for you to, to have your brother Philip's wife Herodias. And he wanted to have him killed, but he knew that there would be an uprising of the people if he had done that. So he was sitting on that. It was his birthday. We're going to start at Matthew 14, verse 6. We're going to um, go into 7 and skip to 9. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them, skipping to verse 7. Therefore, he, um, Herod, promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask, skipping to verse 9. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. And I thought, isn't that interesting? It's that word, nevertheless. The king was sorry that he had made this promise, but the truth was he was sitting with officials. Everybody at the party heard him make that commitment, that probably rash commitment. Oh, that was wonderful. I'm going to give you whatever you want. He wasn't thinking 
that she would go to her mother and her mother would demand the head of John the Baptist on a platter. It says the king was sorry. He felt badly, but because he was caught in that moment, his words mattered. And you know, it took me right away to Psalm 1914. The psalmist says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know, there's times in life when we have been caught up in the moment and we have said the wrong thing or perhaps we've done the wrong thing and we're going to do that. There are times that we're going to do that. But you know what? Let's not get ourselves caught in those moments. Let's understand that our words matter, whether they're encouraging and uplifting words, that when we set our mind on things above, then the good things that we've stored in our heart, those are the things that come out. But when we don't and we get caught in the moment, sometimes we say and do the wrong thing. So let's be careful. Let's do what what David did when he wrote, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I want to tell you that on the Roku channel, we have a Bible Discovery Network. We play the programs that we do here, and we also play other programs we create here. So I would suggest that you check it out if you have a Roku box. It's good, or on the internet, whatever. You can find us. I'm telling you about that now. Also, I want to pray for you. Lord, I'm listening now. Father, help me and help us to become people who listen and hear and follow your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.